mural, urban beautification, aerosol art, graffiti. All of these words can be used to describe one piece of work done by a man who calls himself Persuay. A name that was taken and not given. When I asked Dave for an interview, I thought we'd talk art, design, and being a master of interaction with a spray can. I dive into the world of graffiti and street art. Instead, I found a master of interaction of a different sort. Dave Persuay is a master of names. From murals across the world to the logos of beloved brands like DC and Home, Dave Persuay has made a life of making letters into pictures and pictures into worlds to explore. He's given names to countless companies and shoes, shirt lines, characters, and collaborators, and each time he built what it meant to be Persuay. Hi, I'm Joe Unger, and this is Pinball Rules, where we find out what it is to design for humans. Today, we talk to Dave Persuay, aerosol artist, brand director, and designer, and how he spent a lifetime understanding our interaction with each other, our cities, and our clothes, all to understand the design of a name. So Persuay is your street art name, and for people who follow that scene, Bunny Kitty is what they'd be most familiar with. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Bunny Kitty is something that is easy to, easily recognized and digested by people outside of graffiti, and that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to create a story of an artist, of a coming of age, of experience, of travel, of being brave, of sacrifice. So I'm telling it through this character in this universe that I created. If a child is looking at the character, they'd see this very cute cat in a in a bunny suit. You know, it's very somewhat shallow, I think, um, but it resonates with them. And then for people that are a little bit older and or people that are familiar with my history or my work, they get to see it in a, in a bigger light because they get to understand that it's it's just not a story about this character, Bunny Kitty. It's an entire universe that I'm like pushing out through aerosol art, what people have come to call it street art. Use the term aerosol art and street art, but not graffiti. What does that all mean? I have to use street art because a lot of people outside of the movement recognize this as a negative. The real way or the real term is aerosol art because if you call it graffiti, it's it's kind of a negative thing. So whenever you put a negative out into the world, then it kind of attracts all this stuff. There are graffiti elements to this movement and there's no denying it. I mean, it's all over every major city or every suburb now of the world. You know, it's gone from a subculture that was created in Philadelphia and New York by children and has blossomed into this entire movement that our contemporaries don't necessarily understand, but they're starting to be able to to digest it through street art. But there's a lot of people that get overlooked because people are just discovering it through Banksy. But there is an entire group of people that were responsible of uh, creating these aesthetics and how things are painted and techniques and style and all this stuff. It's a, a world all to itself. So do the different terms change the way you approach your work? Um, using those terms to approach no, my design, no, I wouldn't say that it, it alters my approach or anything. I think it just depends what I want to do on that particular wall. If I want to do it something that's revolving around Bunny Kitty and characters, then I already know going into it that it's going to be like that. If I want to do something that's more traditional, like a aerosol or letter style piece, something more for myself, then I just go into that. I teetered back and forth between what is known now as street art and traditional works, uh, what is known as aerosol art or graffiti. And um, I, I think it just really depends on my surroundings, on what I'm, who I'm with and what I'm going to do. There are people that can handle doing multiple projects and do them great. Things like design and art and product design and development and communication. So, right, like yourself, you've worked across murals, clothing, branding, and fine art, and a ton more. But how did design become a thing in your life? Um, I had no background in uh, graphic design 
at all. It was something that I haphazardly uh, fell into, and I was discovered as a as a graffiti artist, a young one. I was 19 and discovered by a small t-shirt company and turned in my first t-shirt graphic to them on a subway napkin. And this was 1992. And this graphic did so well, they just were like, okay, well, we did so well with that one drawing. So they just kind of rated my, my book of ideas and they were like, well, we'll make a t-shirt out of that, we'll make a t-shirt out of that. So I developed a relationship with these, these people and they were like, well, you know, there's opportunity with that as they were making money off of these concepts and they had their kind of like, uh, they had their uh, foundation pretty set, you know, with, uh, it was a skate brand and they worked with pros or emerging pros. It was very early in uh, the reinsurgence of skateboarding. So 92, um, it was, skateboarding was still kind of small after its huge explosion in the 80s. And uh, it was on its way back up with this new wave of, of skateboarders and companies owned by skaters or friends of skaters type thing, you know. So this ability to draw and give them ideas, they just asked me for more. And so they, at some point they were like, well, we want to hire you. Because they knew they could, they could probably get me for super cheap. I was 19. I didn't, I didn't know anything really about business. I just knew that, oh, I, I love to draw. They hired me, and I was, I was in the warehouse packing boxes and drawing part-time whenever they needed me to. And this company uh, was a t-shirt company by the name of 8-Ball, and 8-Ball became Drawers Clothing, and then Drawers Clothing became Dub Outerwear, and all of those companies eventually became DC Shoes. So I was the founding art director uh, for all of those companies creating brand aesthetics and stories and direction without really knowing what I was doing. I just, uh, I never had designed a logo at all, but I designed the DC logo that they were going to end up putting on all these shoes and then their ads. And I did the dub logo and then I said, well, dub is obviously, it sounds like music. So let's do a music aesthetic, you know, like around this, this brand. And at that time there was nothing really out there in the market. This was the early nineties. And, uh, with that, you know, there were computers around, and it was like Illustrator 1 or something like that. So I was able to sit down and then learn how to put my drawing into computers and learn how to color and then eventually learn how to just design. And it was just these people, these young companies that were like, well, here's a kid that uh, is channeled into something. He's out there in the streets writing graffiti or painting graffiti. And, you know, a lot of youth relate to that powerful art that's happening on the West Coast or exploding on the West Coast. And I think it had a lot to do with just being in the right place at the right time. And given the opportunities, I, I kind of jumped in head first. It, so it sounds like you found your way along this very organically. I guess so, but I was terribly modest when I was young. I didn't realize what I was doing. When I was a kid, before I got into all this, I was inspired by all the post-punk music coming out of Europe and I would buy all these import records and I would study the record sleeves of the record labels 4AD, you know, like the Cocteau Twins and I would look at, you know, these records and I was really into just visually what they were putting together and, and how they were packaging these bands. So I think that was probably my school was looking at record covers as a kid. I was going to go into the Navy because I thought the only way I was going to get out of San Diego at the time was to travel in the Navy. And I had one more signature, but because of what I was doing with these guys, uh, Ken Block and Damon Way, they were like, hey, you know, we'll hire you. And I was like, well, there goes the Navy. I'm an artist now, or I'm going to pursue this. So the street art movement in the 90s is really iconic for me. So did you find that that movement it was filled with a lot of collaborators? There weren't too many people doing it like we were. There was Andy Howell. You know, Dave Kinsey was coming up. Shepard hadn't moved to the West Coast yet, but was making his move to the West Coast. And it was an exciting time in San Diego and in California for uh, design and the street movement. So it sounds like California and the actual physical location of it really played a heavy role in how everything came together. You know, you had the skates, you had talent, you had this kind of time where a lot of street art was happening. Do you think that cities like uh, like how San Diego and L.A. were at that time still have that power today? Jeez, that's, I don't know. It seems like all that that you say can come out of anywhere now just because of what's so accessible to the person 
you know, with computers and ideas. Like I was saying, there wasn't too many people doing it on the level we were as far as being involved with brands and creating something that eventually became streetwear. I mean, I wasn't too aware of it, but uh, I just think that you could be anywhere and do it. Yeah, I don't know. You know, I, I don't think you could focus on one part of the world anymore or planet. I think it's about the individuals now and uh, what these individuals are bring to a movement. Because I came out of a suburb of San Diego. I didn't come out of a, of a city element. Uh, my dad was from the Bronx, and my, my mom was from uh, upstate New York. So my father was pretty streetwise. To be introduced to aerosol art or graffiti out of being a suburb kid, that was probably an early representation of what was to become. Something that music and art surpassed this urban setting and was affecting kids that were just bored or hungry for more. So who holds the reins now? I mean, who, who are the vanguards of the street art movement? And how do these designs even become proliferated now? How do they populate across things? It happens fast, you know, like, and people are influenced by maybe somebody that was influenced by, they were influenced by, but that person was influenced by one of my friends or my, myself, perhaps. But, you know, as I, as I see what's happening, I see, okay, I could, I could definitely see my influence on that style or aesthetic. And, uh, you know, I could say the same for, you know, a lot of my friends yeah. who are kind of like the tastemakers of, of the movement now. The contemporaries, they are starting to understand, like I said, in 100 years, they'll be talking about us. So it sounds like for street art, you really have to get into the world. Like The one thing that, that separates it is you really have to get face-to-face -face with people and start to get your hands dirty, put stuff up on walls in different places, and really get to know the community. Um, uh, you could be painting the back of a barn and have developed a great style, but not traveled anywhere and not have done the groundwork to really contribute to what it's about. Really, I mean, it's about getting up. It, it used to be just in your city or in your town, but it's, it's an international thing now that you could travel and do this. And there's people that really still get this, but I think to people outside of it, it's something that's lost. With street art, I think there's a there's a confusion. These artists that emerge, and maybe they're technically muralists using spray paint, but they have a nickname that's very graffiti. It's, you know, it's, it's connected to graffiti and, and that foundation, but they don't have the core values or the knowledge of their predecessors and who came before them. So a lot of that gets lost now, and it, it's starting to kind of pull away. And you can see... You can, you can see it happening, and, and there, that's why there's people like myself, people that are very core, when they get the opportunity to talk about it, then, you know, it's like, hey, this is really, this is really the core foundation of what this street art is. Like, you have to look at the history here, because these techniques and, and this exciting art form was started right here. This is, this is where it began. Right. You know, I've seen... Uh, diagrams or charts that put street art next to graffiti, but really, it's really hard for me to digest that because I really feel that street art is a splinter off of graffiti. You know, they're trying to categorize themselves as their own movement, you know, probably spearheaded by Invader and Shepard and all this stuff. But if you look before them, Shepard and, and, and Invader and these guys, you have guys like Revs and cost and guys that were doing it on the same magnitude as Shepard was, but just timing wise, they weren't able to get the amount of exposure because this was, you know, early eighties and, you know, usually the guys in, in the beginning kind of get overlooked, you know, but within our, <clears throat> within our, uh, within our movement or within our, uh, you know, the core, uh, you know, people that, get into this, uh, they, they tend to, re, uh, you know, find the, the true history and who was involved with what, and, and uh, it's really interesting, you know. Uh, but, uh, you know, with design and the accessibility of all this stuff and the tools, it's saturated. And I think it goes back to what I was saying uh, with all these, uh, there weren't so many people doing what we were doing, but it eventually became industry standard and I just felt myself 
not really needing to be involved with all of it because there were so many people pursuing that career or wanting to be a designer, wanting to be an artist, wanting to be a name, wanting to do this and that and make a living. And I just, it pushed me to a point, well, I'd much rather rely on myself since I've been able to create a name for myself or a brand. Um, and I would rather sacrifice Make a, make a sacrifice and go for it than ever wonder like, oh, what if? Or, you know, what if I didn't do that? Or So that takes us to now. And that takes us to when Persuade became Persuade. So what was that moment for you? When did that happen? Um, in 2007, I had left a very good job to just do myself, do me. I think I could do it. I have enough momentum, people behind me. I got distracted, I did a favor, and it took me a few years to actually get her back around to it. And I think when I lost that work environment, I let go of that and realized, okay, well, I'm starting over, but at least I have this foundation because I had driven it home through the years so many times, you know. I had stayed dedicated to my craft and to what I love and what was meant for me of being an artist. It was something that I was kind of raised to be. When you're grandmother and mother say, you're an artist. You come from a line of artists and directors and this and that. I had no, I didn't know what that meant. You know, I wanted to be a professional soccer player. It was just natural. Excuse me. I have all this experience that I'm able to, uh, to kind of like rest my laurels on because I was there and I'd done it. And I, had, I'd, I think as people discover me more, they will be like, hey, this guy, he had a lot bigger influence on not just graffiti, but an entire other movement. And uh, I was simultaneously riding two highways at once. So it's interesting how you changed words there, how you went from designer to artist and from writing to branding. It sounds like there's a lot of conflict there between those names. Did you find yourself changing the name of what you were doing depending on what you were working on? Uh, I was going back and forth. It was crazy. I was like, oh, no, this month I'm going to be a hardcore graffiti writer. And, you know, maybe I'm just not going to really use the computer too much. I'm relying on it too much. I should back off and start to illustrate some more because really that's what separates me from a lot of people is being able to draw. Or oh, sitting down and developing a brand and creating a logo and aesthetic like, and getting the same gratification as like being able to draw and do something fresh or doing a mural. I was like, oh, you know what? You know, I actually really like that. There became so much of it, and like you started to see your aesthetic applied to T-shirts in Target, and this and that. It became like ah, I was like, ah, well, I just need to separate myself more from that. So I've completely engulfed myself into my art and my paintings and my concepts, and that was 25 years later. So, do you have a different approach when you think of something as a design? I don't know. I mean, it all kind of seems like it comes from the same place. It's just a matter of like, okay, well, I'm just going to design something this time. You know, I'm going to sit down and work on the computer or use it as a tool. I don't know if it was ever a line that I crossed. It's just like computer and graphic design is a tool to just continue to tell the story. Right. We've got this moment in time where we've got tools now. And what we used to think of as just illustrator and design are these tools that all of these digital artists are out there. Everybody that used to use a pencil and a paper and a spray can to do art were able to iterate so much faster on all these ideas. So in comparison to maybe 20, 30 years ago where we might only see one piece, we see thousands of pieces from people across the world. And we're all working in this kind of global hive mind, trying to find some way to communicate together in a better way. Well, I think that's what it is, is communication and, and telling a story, right, of whatever you're involved with. It's like convincing people that something is cool. Like, I worked in a very cool-oriented industry, as you did, you know, with video games. Skateboarding, to us, it was selling cool. And we were, de we were designing brands out of thin air based around a, uh, uh, maybe you have a pro rider affiliated, and maybe it's an easy sell because of that pro rider. You can come up with a name and a, a decent icon, and the rest is product and, and marketing, or pieces of the puzzle that come together. So the streetwear industry is huge now, and you're making your own way. You've got Bunny Kitty, you've got Home, and you've got Persuade. So what's the future? It lies within what I want to do now. I've done it for other people, and I want to do it for me. So my heart lies in my projects. It, that encompasses everything I know. 
the idea is to create product and income, income that will come in and help me be persuade the artist that enjoys to paint murals, to express himself through his paintings, uh, his fine art through abstract works or whatever I feel like getting into, whatever I want to discover or explore. And Holm and, and Bunny Kitty are, are stories, I feel, important stories to be told through their brands. We could all look at ourselves now as brands because we're all trying to push our existence on the public. Whether it be, you know, followers on Instagram or Facebook or to be liked. We want to be like, hey, this is my voice. I'm over here. This is what I'm about. Even if I'm a fine artist and a painter of emotion and leaving it up to you to pull a story out of an abstract painting of mine, that's my communication to you. It's just more in a vague way. Whereas graphic design and Bunny Kitty, is, it's straight in your face. Like, hey, this is a story about a, a, a cat in a magic bunny suit. And Home is a story about our uncle and his dog in the bar and John Lennon and rock and roll and New York heritage. The first way is just an artist that was born in 1972 and discovered that I had a knack for something. So a graffiti tag turned into a brand, which became the name of an artist named Persuay. Sergey and I had actually talked about this same topic about a week before when we discussed meaning machines. Part of that conversation was actually around the nature of words and language, and just like our conversation today, the names of things. Turns out there's a whole school of psychology around investigating these ideas, words and texts and language, as he explains. And if you, when you translate the same text to a different language, you generate new meanings because by slightly changing the nuance, the, the, the connotations of words, in many cases it's just impossible to find exact match in a different language, you create new meanings. There are slight variations of meanings and great variations by, by choice of words. And some of the writers, bilingual writers, like Nabokov, for example, they love to write about how different languages help you to, to write differently about different things. Some languages are, are more suitable to write about different things. The boundaries between languages or cultures, they are meaning-generating devices. In the sense that when you translate from one language to another, uh, or from one format to one medium to another, a novel to uh, a play, or to a, to, to, to a script for, for, for film, uh, they are translations to different media and they generate new meanings. Because when you look at things, when you read it, your experience is radically different and you imagine a character, you visualize a character when you read about him or her in the novel uh, and you, you have a very different experience from that uh, you get from watching that character embodied in an actor uh, in a movie. Later, Trisha and I sat down to talk about how the names of things affect a game studio when artists are trying to understand a design. I think that our roles as artists within this new digital age is evolving so much faster than our words is. Our words take a long time to develop and to define, but the roles that we play, especially now that you know the internet age has happened and the smartphone age has happened and all the software is out there, we are making these very specific roles of positions we don't have words for, like a graphic designer. What does that mean now? There are many different types of graphic designers. There are different types of digital artists, but we have these very limited words because it's just so new in our world that we don't have the names for what we're actually doing. I was just reading today that user experience designer is like the number two growth category for new students coming out of college.
Right. And the difference between a user experience designer and a user interface designer and the line between those two things is blurry and, and messy. Our world is incredibly new. Persuay lives in in a world with actual paint on actual walls. It's not even the digital world, and we still haven't caught up with the right words for it. That's how slow our language is evolving. We have all the words, but we don't know which ones are the right ones. We don't know which ones are the actual defined word. If you look up graffiti in a dictionary, what does it say? Does it say vandalism? I'm not even sure. Is that the word that we want to describe? It just means art out of a spray can that's put up on a wall, but we have to have 15 different ways to say it, and each way has this this reaction. Right, because if you're in Southern California and you're putting up graffiti, you're breaking the law. But right. if you're performing aerosol art right. and you're beautifying an alleyway... It's no different from someone painting a mural on the side of a wall, but if you paint a mural without being asked, is that graffiti? Turns out, interacting with names is something we deal with every day. And for some of us, the masters of these names we call brand designers, font makers, and street artists, that name can take a lifetime to design. This has been Pinball Rules, where we find out what it is to design for humans. And I've been your host, Joe Unger. Thanks for listening. Pinball Rules Podcast is recorded in San Diego, California, featuring your hosts, Joe Unger, creative commentator, Trisha Williams, science commentator, Sergey Gepstein, audio direction and original music by Michael David Peter, and production assistance from Laura Rapalski. For more information on our guests and downloads, go to pinballrulespodcast.com. Pinball Rules Podcast is a copyright of Pigeonhole Productions 2015.